Welcome to those of you joining. Uh, we'll probably just give it a couple of minutes uh, for people to log in and then we'll get started in just a minute or two. All right, uh, it's about two past the hour, so I think we'll get started just in a, uh, to honor the, the time that everybody has this evening. So we have two great cases today. First, um, I want to welcome you all to the March CIS uh, Case Conference webinar, and um, this is sponsored by the Early Career Immunologist Committee. We have one typically uh, every month. Our next one will be in April, and then um, in two months, we'll be um, at our meeting in St. Louis, which I have the arch here for you, just to remind you all. Hope to see you all there. Remember that uh, membership for CIS for trainees is free, and you can join by going to us to the CIS website. Um, so first, let's get started. Uh, so we have a great case coming here from Washington University in St. Louis uh, by Dr. Sarah Mehta, a clinical fellow in pediatric rheumatology, allergy, and immunology. And we have a fantastic senior mentor, Dr. Gigi Notarangelo, who is well known in the CIS and in the field of IEI, um, who is a uh, senior investigator at the NH, chief of the immune deficiency genetics section um, and clinical immunology and microbiology. Um, so let's get started. Um, and remember, you can put, uh, please put all comments, and this is meant to be interactive, put all comments in the chat box. And uh, I'll we'll be monitoring the chat box. We'll have a couple of uh, breaks for that as well. And make sure when you set your chat box, set it to everybody so that we can all see the comments and not just hosts and panelists. All right, go ahead, Dr. Mehta. Thanks, Erica. Um, so today, this presentation that I'm giving is called Erasing the Skid Marks, a Quest for Thymic Transplant. So time for an outside hospital consult call. I get a call about a two-week-old Caucasian full-term male who is admitted to their NICU, and he was noted to have an abnormal newborn screen. Fairly standard consult, so I got a little bit more history. He's stable on room air. He was noted to have a small posterior soft palate cleft. Um, he had, was noted to have discoordinated feeding as a result, and he was requiring gavage feeds. He had a screening cardiac echo, which showed a moderate to large ASD. He also had several dysmorphic features, which were noted, and the outside hospital genetics had already been consulted with a CMA that had already returned normal. He had a renal ultrasound as a result of his, um, from his dysmorphic features, and that was also normal. And also due to his dysmorphic features, he underwent a screening head ultrasound and a sacral ultrasound, which were both normal. He also had a MRI brain, which showed evidence of multiple vascular, vascular territory in utero ischemic injury. From an immunology standpoint, his day of life zero Illinois skid screen had a CQ consistent with an undetectable T cell receptor excision circle or TREC. He also had a CBC at the time, which showed a white blood cell count of 8.5 down from 22 at birth. He had an absolute lymphocyte cell count, which was 1720, and an absolute eosinophil count of 890. Otherwise, his CBC was quite reassuring. And he, I got some family history, which was pretty unremarkable. There was no known consanguinity, and the parents originated from different states. So we recommended further lab workup and also recommended full skid precautions, which I don't have time to go into detail of that today. 
We started him on a cycle of year and fluconazole prophylaxis due to growing concern for skid. A few days later, we called to get follow-up on the labs that they had drawn there. And his IgA was undetectable, his, his IgG was 710, and he had an IgM of 37.8. His immune competence and Trectomeo were still pending at the time of transfer, but he did have a CD4 RTE that had returned, showing a CD4 absolute count of eight cells per microliter, as well as undetectable CD4, CD45, RA, CD31 positive cells, or CD4 RTEs which was consistent with the absence of thymic emigrants. He had a repeat newborn screen at day of life three, which returned that same day as well, again, revealing Trex with a CQ of zero. His immune competence panel eventually returned, showing profound T cell deficiency with undetectable CD4 cells, undetectable CD8s. He did have normal B cell counts and NK cell counts. He had a chest X-ray, which was normal and did show the presence of a thymic silhouette. And at that point, he was transferred to us for higher acuity and more specialized care for the diagnosis of SCID. So upon arrival to our NICU, he, um, there, it was notable for multiple dysmorphic features, including, um, but not limited to posterior rotated low set ears, a cleft palate, depressed nasal bridge and bulbous nose, pectus excavatum, clinodactyly and hypotonia. He also is noted to have a murmur from his ASD and PDA. And overall, he was quite well appearing. He had normal vital signs. He had no rashes at the time. He had no hepatosplenomegaly or respiratory distress. And so our interventions, we continued him on fluconazole and acyclovir. And at one month of age, he was started on Bactrim. He was given IVIG replacement therapy. Our bone marrow consult or our bone marrow transplant team was consulted, and we sent ATO or artificial thymic organoid testing through the NIH, which I will elaborate more on later. So our assessment at the time before I get into differentials is a two-week-old full-term Caucasian male born to non-consanguineous parents with T negative, P B positive, NK positive skid multiple dysmorphisms, feeding difficulty in utero stroke and eosinophilia. And so I will now pause to allow thoughts from the audience on differential diagnoses. You can type it in the chat. All right, um, we're up for some interaction here. So if everybody wants to put any thoughts on your differential diagnosis here for this T minus B plus and K plus skid with dysmorphic features. We have oh, anybody? Twenty two Q deletion. Uh, some thoughts coming in. Uh, there's a question that went to the host and panelists asking if Dada two can present with skid. Um, not typically a severe combined immune deficiency, but there can be some mild to moderate immune deficiency with that condition. Uh, TBX mutation is uh, ADA skid, charge. What? All right. We have a couple. Anybody else? Any last minute thoughts before we move on here? All right. Good. We have a couple of things here in the chat. Um, why don't you go on and show yeah. the differential? Sure. So these are some of the differentials that I thought of. The ones in the chat are great differentials. Just a note on the 22Q and charge. He did have a CMA, which was normal. Um, and so moving on to the differentials, I kind of bucketed them into T negative, B, uh, B positive, NK positive skid that you see on your classical um, immunodeficiency classifications that have been published. And then I also differ differentiate it into the skeletal dysplasia with immune dysfunction. 
Um, so a few that I felt were pertinent included IL-7-RA deficiency, which is a pretty common cause of this type of skid, um, CD3-delta deficiency, CDC-epsilon deficiency, CD3-zeta deficiency, FOX-N1 deficiency, also known as nude skid, PAX-1 deficiency, or otofacial cervical syndrome type 2. Within the skeletal dysplasias, we could consider cartilage hair hypoplasia, Schimke immunoosseous dysplasia, spondyloechochondro dysplasia with immune dysfunction. I think I forgot to include that one on my list. Um, and then lastly, immunoskeletal dysplasia with neurodevelopmental abnormalities or AS, IS DNA. So genetic testing, of course, holds our answer. And so we'll move on to his genetic testing result. As I mentioned before, the patient had a normal CMA, and he also had normal mitochondrial sequencing, which was sent by our genetic team. Our genetic team sent a TRIO rapid genome sequencing, including from both parents, which detected compound heterozygous variants in the EXTL3 gene, as you can see here, which my co-fellow Armin um, made. So, um, he also had a primary immunodeficiency genetic panel, which showed two VUSs and EXTL3 consistent with the TRIO findings that have been sent. And so even though mut the mutations were variants of unknown significance, given his clinical presentation, um, they were felt to be causative of his disease. So I will now go into a little bit more about EXTL3 and EXTL3 deficiency. Exostosin like glycosyl transferase 3 or EXTL3 is a very ubiquitously expressed gene encoding an enzyme involved in the synthesis of heparin sulfate, um, which in vivo is covalently bound to specific core proteins as um, heparin sulfate proteoglycans or HSPG. These HSPGs play a critical role in skeletal and hematopoietic immune system development, including modulating activities of fibroblast growth factors, bone morphogenic protein, sonic, heg sonic heg I can't say this, this is a tongue twister, sonic hedgehog, and several interleukins. Um, EXTL3 deficiency, also known as immunoskeletal dysplasia with neurodevelopmental abnormalities, or ISDNA, is a very rare autosomal recessive condition due to biallelic mutations in EXTL3. EXTL3 deficiency was discovered in 2017. It was actually reported by three separate groups in 2017, coincidentally, including Oud et al., Volpe et al., and Guo et al. Our patient, to our knowledge, is the 17th reported case of EXTL3 deficiency and the first ever caused by compound heterozygous variants of EXTL3. Um, so there have been a handful of studies uh, involving EXTL3. Oud et al. and Volpe et al., both in 2017, together demonstrated how T-cell immunodeficiency in EXTL3 deficiency is a result of impaired colonization of the thymus by common lymphoid progenitor cells and or their expansion into the thymus. So Oud et al. in 2017 showed that the EXTL3 protein is expressed in hematopoietic stem cells and in early stages of T-cell development. Volpe et al. did several experiments um, they showed that EXTL3 mutations resulted in inhibited T cell development, primarily at the stage of expansion of early hematolymphoid progenitor cells and their colonization in the thymus. They also showed that those with EXTL3 mutations have defective maturation of thymic epithelial cells by modulating FGF signaling. Um, I'll go briefly into this experiment, how they showed that. So first, they applied human-induced um, pluripotent stem cells to a protocol used to induce differentiation of human embryonic stem cells to definitive endoderm, which is DE, ventral pharyngeal endoderm, um, which is VPE, and then thymic epithelial progenitors, which is TEP. So those are the different stages. They um, underwent timely regulated exposure to specific developmental cues shown in figure B here, 
which allowed progressive differentiation of um, the control derived iPSCs. And so um, I won't go too much into detail of the genes, but essentially the differential expression of genes marked different stages of the cells. And so they compared gene expression at the thymic epithelial stage, showing that EXTL3 mutated cells had decreased expression of TBX1, EYA1, and CK1 compared to regular control-derived cells. Um, and there was also a similar but insignificant um, trend seen with FOXN1. In contrast, the EXTL3 mutant cells kept high levels of SOX17, which in the control cells reached peak expression at the definitive endoderm stage and then were downregulated. So essentially what this experiment showed was that EXTL3 deficiency affects thymic epithelial cell differentiation. Um, just of note, the importance of this finding is still unclear. Another interesting experiment, which I'll go through a little bit quicker, is that um, in the same paper, these authors demonstrated that EXTL3 mutant zebrafish have defective thymopoiesis. And so to prove that the defect was caused by EXTL3 mutation, they injected the mutant and sibling zygotes with wild-type human EXTL3 mRNA and observed rescue in the thymic phenotype. Um, so basically what figure um, A shows is that the EXTL3 mutant versus the sibling, the mutant has much smaller pectoral fins. In figure B, you can see they fluorescently tagged the thymus and the um, EXTL knockout has a much uh, smaller thymus. Same with figure C, um, this is just kind of zooming into the thymic volume and you can see the thymic volume in the knockout is much smaller. Figure D shows just in graph form that the thymic volume has been knocked out um, in the EXTL3 knockout. Um, and then figure E shows rescue with the wild type uh, RNA. And then same, the uh, pectoral fin length has also been rescued. So moving on to the clinical features of EXTL3, in the known cases thus far, all, all major mal malformations and features occurred pretty much in three organ systems only, namely the immune system, the skeleton, and the neurological system. Facial dysmorphisms and abnormalities in the skeletal system were consistently observed in 100% of the patients we have thus far, which is 17 patients, with cardinal features being um, platyspondyly, brachydactyly, and kyphoscoliosis, as well as, of course, facial dysmorphisms. In contrast, the degree and frequency of the immune and neurological um, impairment really varied across the board. So for the immune system, generally immune findings were severe T-cell lymphopenia, of, including both CD4 and CD8 cells, while the other hematopoietic um, cell lineages seemed to have pretty normal development. 11 of the 17 no patients had T-cell lymphopenia, ranging in severity from very mild deficiency all the way to skin. Five of these patients who had lymphopenia also developed Omen syndrome, suggesting that immune dysregulation can be a feature of disease. Some patients had spontaneous improvement in the T-cell counts and immune function, and nine of the patients had hypogam. Um, neurologically, intellectual um, disability and global developmental delay seem to be pretty common, with, common within these patients. Seizures in about a third of patients, and then hypotonia or hypertonia in about half of the patients. Also, liver cysts have been commonly found in these patients as well. Moving on to outcomes, four of the 17 known patients passed, unfortunately, when they were less than one year of age, and one passed when, when they were 30 years old. The rest, at the time of their publication, they were alive, um, anywhere between the age of two and 38 years old. Of the 11 published patients who had EXTL3 deficiency with T-cell lymphopenia, only one received um, bone marrow transplant, and that was published in Udit al in 2017. Um, HSCT resulted in complete recovery of normal T cell development without affecting the non-immune defects. And so one thought is that it's possible that the thymic function could have been restored by repopulation of the thymus with the HSCT donor-derived thymocytes 
um, this hypothesis is based off of a previously reported patient with a different thymic stromal defect who developed um, naive T cells after HSCT. Um, of note, this patient did have an older sibling with EXTL3 deficiency who was also published, um, although he had much milder T cell lymphopenia, and so he was not transplanted. Um, there was a question about whether have congenital heart de defects been previously described. I didn't actually find that um, in my reading, I don't think. Erica, did you? Yeah. No, I didn't see that. Yeah. As a, as a no, it has not been described. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, of note, though, this patient just had an ASD and a PDA, so it wasn't a very significant heart finding. Um, yeah. So... A discussion on thymic transplant versus bone marrow transplant. Thymic stromal defects can be successfully treated with thymic transplantation. Sometimes the thymic defects are discovered only after failed attempt at T cell reconstitution with HSCT. At this point, successful thymic transplant is complicated by multiple things. Um, one could be potentially needing to match MHC alleles, which may have originally been mismatched in the original HSCT, um, to, and this would increase the risk of graft-versus-host disease. Um, and after bone marrow transplant, often there are severe post-HSCT morbidities. Therefore, of course, it's preferable, preferable to identify a hematopoietic versus a thymic defect early on to thus facilitate administration of the correct treatment the first time. So enter the ATO or artificial thymic organoid. ATOs express DLL, which is a notch ligand important thymopoiesis, and can support the differentiation of CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells into um, mature T cells. And what happens basically is that you put the patient's CD34 positive T HSPCs into the ATO, you culture it, and the idea is that healthy cells will undergo T cell maturation. The basic principle is that HSCs from patients with thymic stromal defects should be able to move through the T cell development stages to, degener to generate mature T cells when supported by the ATO with normal formation of double negative T cells and TCR alpha beta. Meanwhile, the HSCs from those with a hematopoietic defect is impaired despite the support of the ATO because the defect is not thymic, although there are exceptions which we may get into later. I will now pause to allow our senior mentor, Dr. Nacharangelo, to elaborate on any specifics of the ATO and to walk us through our patient's ATO test, which is displayed here. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, great presentation, by the way. So uh, these are the results of the um, in vitro differentiation of unmobilized uh, CD34 positive cells from the patient. The patient is labeled as KID506 USA. A, a travel control and also another control obtained here in the uh, Department of Laboratory Medicine at the NIH. And so what we did, basically what Marita did, and Marita is actually in, uh, in the audience today, um, we basically analyzed by flow cytometry uh, these uh, developing T cells at various stages of T cell development using appropriate markers. We do this typically at five weeks and also six weeks of in vitro culture, so that's how long uh, the assay takes. And you can follow uh, maturation of the T cells by looking at the expression of CD7, uh, CD5, then CD7 is slightly downregulated, CD1A is markedly upregulated. At that stage, uh, basically uh, cells become double positive. So if you stain them for CD4 and CD8, you will see the appearance of double positive cells and you see those cells in the penultimate column here. Uh, and you see that those cells develop normally in uh, uh, both controls and in the patient. And the last column actually uh, shows the proportion of cells that express this receptor alpha beta on the X axis and CD3 on the Y axis. And again, you see nice development also mature T cells. So based on what Sarah told you, uh, this would suggest actually a uh, thymic intrinsic problem because we see here that the CD34 positive cells from the patient 
are normally able to differentiate into mature T cells, but one has to take this with a grain of salt. And a grain of salt is the following. As Sarah has mentioned, both our group, yes, uh, as well as the group of OAT, have demonstrated that there is a problem with the expansion of the early progenitor cells, hematopoietic progenitor cells, and the seeding of very early um, T cell progenitors to the thymus, which is something we cannot model with this assay because the assay, is, I mean, uh, uh, the assay you already provide uh, the CD34 positive cells, all of the signals that are needed uh, to make them become T cells. You're not looking at migration of those cells to the thymus. So that is the real caveat here. It is also true, as Sarah is showing on this slide, that one patient was supposedly cured with hematopoietic stem cell transplant. But remember that she showed you that there are many patients who actually spontaneously improved. And it's unclear on the, on the basis of N of one, whether a transplant is really uh, the uh, way to go uh, for these patients with hematopoietic stem cell transplant versus thymic transplant. I should also add, that although Odadal reported expression of this um, uh, gene, this, this protein actually, uh, in uh, um, hematopoietic stem cells and also in early progenitor T cells, when Marita analyzed by flow cytometry uh, on human thymus cells, uh, both the thymic stromal uh, cells, so the thymic epithelial cells, and the thymocytes, the expression was much higher in the thymic epithelial cells. So that would suggest a, a more prominent role in the thymic epithelial cell compartment. So, the real answer is that we don't know yet what is the optimal treatment for these patients. And again, unfortunately, treatment is also severely limited by many other complications that some of these patients do experience, in particular mm -hmm. uh, from a neurological standpoint, but also skeletal, as well as um, also uh, in some cases there are um, strictures. I mean, the uh, swallowing is very compromised. Uh, and I mean, you've seen that these patients require gavage, by the way. So those are all um, you know, significant issues that one has to take into consideration. But it's important to appreciate uh, the power and also the limitation of the in vitro assays that we have available. And I, I think that was the most important thing actually mm -hmm. in this presentation, in addition to describing so nicely, Sarah, what the phenotype of these patients is, how variable it is, which can indicate actually that you know, different uh, mutations may have quite a different effect. On, uh, on T cell development, not so much on the other issues. So again, the skeletal uh, mm -hmm. manifestations are pretty much consistent. I mean, platyspondyl is very, very common in these patients. Obviously they have uh, um, you know, short limbs, very short limbs. The pectoral fins that you saw in the zebrafish, that's exactly equivalent of the upper limbs in mm -hmm. humans. So you know, they're, they're small, very small. Somebody um, in the uh, chat asked, would it be possible to biopsy a patient thymus to assess for seeding of early progenitors? Yeah, so it's a it's a great question. So it is possible in theory to biopsy the thymus. It's not without risks and it's something that, you know, we don't tend to do anymore uh, in the clinical practice. You could analyze and you could search actually for early thymic progenitor cells. There are markers also to look at those. Uh, those are very rare cells in the thymus. So you know, again, you don't want to take, uh, um, I mean, you can even take just a small sample of the thymus, but it's not without risk. So it's not a procedure that is typically done in, in this situation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you know it's, a, it's a good idea. Uh, and in some cases might actually be informative. I think we're running close on time. Um, uh, one other, actually, the mother had asked this question on your thoughts on uh, thymic and bone marrow transplant doing both. The patient's mother was quite uh, astute and had this good question, actually. Well, you know, what I would say, so it depends also what kind of donor you have. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a match, uh, a match ready donor, I think that proceeding with a bone marrow transplant alone is probably safer. You have a relatively low risk, not zero, but a lower risk of Graffer-Sos disease and you might, in any case, obtain some T cell reconstitution, even if there is a problem of migration of the stem cells to the, to the thymus. Nonetheless, you could reconstitute with mature T cells contained in the graft, at least for some period of time. For very sick babies, that actually is a life-saving procedure. 
The time of transplant is much more cumbersome. It takes a longer period of time to immune reconstitute. It's not without risk, and Sarah illustrated them well, so I don't have to go through them again. Uh, so, you know, if you have a matched donor, you definitely go first with a bone marrow transplant whenever mm -hmm. you're uncertain whether one or the other should be used. Great. I'll let Sarah wrap up quick, and then we'll move on to our second. Yeah, just real quick, I did have a clinical course for the patient. So we'll use this beautiful graph that my co-fellow Armin created. At um, approximately six weeks of age, the patient developed watery diarrhea um, and a diffuse scaly exfoliative maculopapular rash. At the time, there was a noted rise in his T cell and eosinophil count. He, at the time, had an infectious workup, which was negative, and overall, this um, um, change in his clinical uh, state was consistent with Omen syndrome. He also had a UGI and abdominal ultrasound, which revealed gallstones and sludge, but no obstruction and no intestinal malrotation or other abnormality. He, um, they did find two simple hepatic cysts in his liver. He, um, for his Omen syndrome, he was treated with cyclosporine and steroids with an excellent response to therapy with complete resolution of his rash, diarrhea, and um, decreasing T cell and eosinophil counts. He did require G2 placement for his poor or pharyngeal coordination. He eventually developed hypertension, which was likely related to the cyclosporine. So he was started on amlodipine to help control that. He's currently on the wait list for thymic transplant. And currently he has had no serious infection in serious infectious complications to date. Although he has been admitted a few times for fever rollout, which were always found to be due to a viral infection. And so in conclusion, um, EXTL3 deficiency is an ultra rare cause of T cell skid, skeletal dysplasias and neurodevelopmental abnormalities. EXTL3 is an enzyme required for synthesis of heparin sulfate proteoglycans, which play a critical role in human skeletal and immune system development. EXTL3 deficiency results in defects localized at the level of early T cell development in the thymus and results in abnormal differentiation of thymic epithelial cells. HSCT T cured skid, but not the immune defects in one patient so far with EXTL3. One appropriate thymic transplant is a newer option being used to treat skid, and the ATO can help identify whether a T cell immunodeficiency is due to hematopoietic versus thymic stromal defects and can be beneficial in guiding curative therapy. These are my thank yous, and then I guess we, um, I had written some questions, but we already went through all the questions. We're Just at one point, mm -hmm. I mean, Terry yeah. Ville correctly pointed out that actually a development of Omen syndrome in partial D. George is common. It's also common in some of these other possibly thymus intrinsic mm -hmm. issues where you have residual capacity to generate T cells, and then those T cells undergo massive expansion in the periphery at some point. You have oligoclonal basic representation of T cell receptor repertoire with features of Omen syndrome. Very, very, very common in several of these. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi, Sarah. Great case. Um, we'll move on to the second one just for short on time. So thank you. Hi, great case. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Jacqueline Squire. I'll be the moderator for our next case. And um, I am junior faculty at uh, Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. And today I have uh, one of my um, internal resident, internal medicine residents. He's a PGY2 who's interested in going into allergy and immunology and thinking about applying this next cycle. So keep your eye out for him. And uh, this is Carl Mueller, and he'll be presenting our case today. And then we have as our senior mentor, Dr. Jennifer Lighting, who's adjunct associate professor with John Hopkins University, as well as faculty with Arnold Palmer in Orlando, Florida. So Carl, I'll let you go ahead and get started. All right, thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Squire. All right, so today um, I'm gonna present a case that's called the, you've got some nerve, a case of chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy. So a 17-year-old male presents for the first time to an allergy and immunology clinic. He has a pretty extensive past medical history. At about one year of age, he developed delayed motor milestones as well as regression and had a history of uh, growth failure. At around 18 months, 
uh, nerve conduction and EMG studies were done that were consistent with chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy. Um, he was treated with IVIG monthly with uh, initial improvement uh, happening rapidly within days. He also had recurrent episodes of uh, low-grade uh, temperatures, not quite breaking the 100.4, but 99, 100. And these were associated with um, uh, increased weakness, lymphadenopathy, and it happened about three times a month. And he was typically treated with IV methylprednisolone. Around age seven, he developed uh, decreased strength was transitioned to weekly IV methylprednisolone along with IVIG every three weeks. And he also improved from using a walker to walking independently during this time. Additional studies were done, a repeat nerve conduction velocity uh, and EMG uh, showed demyelinating neuropathy with severely decreased uh, nerve conduction velocities. Here you can see some CSF studies um, with increasing IgG uh, index and in allele clonal bands, um, there was negative for any in infectious encephalitis, but he did have a positive uh, GAD antibody. Genetic testing was done at this time for inherited neuropathies and was negative. He had a nerve biopsy at age eight, and this showed uh, decreased multifocal densities of um, myelinated fibers and some uh, empty nerve strands and onion bulbing. And also noted some small to moderate inflammatory mononuclear cell collections. And here it mentioned this, uh, that the uh, dense onion bulbs and multi uh, uh, factorial pattern is uh, with lots of inflammation uh, is much more likely an uh, inflammatory demyelinating condition than an inherited condition. He was then treated with a Capoxone for six months and had three courses of rituximab during this time in 2008. And he was also treated with azathioprine and none of this was uh, especially helpful. Then his IBIG was increased to 0 0.4 grams per kilogram every two weeks now alternating with uh, methylprednisolone one gram every two weeks and progressively increased his IVIG dosing to up to two grams every, uh, per kilogram every two weeks. And during that time, they decreased his, some of his steroids back to down to 100 milligrams weekly. And at age 14, he had gradual decline in mobility and de development of foot inversions and contractures and multiple spinal abnormalities and scoliosis that required several surgeries, as well as a corrective foot surgery at 16 years of age. And when he pre presented to the immunology clinic, he was currently wheel-bound, but able to transfer independently. So to kind of look at this case in, in, in its totality, we have a, a patient who's presenting to the immunology clinic with some some higher temperatures and about three episodes a month of increased weakness and transient uh, lymph lymphadenopathy in the cervical and axillary regions. He denies any history of recurrent infections requiring antibiotics, persistent lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly, recurrent hospitalizations for infections, no autoimmune conditions, cytopenias, chronic diarrhea, or any family history of any sort of um, immune deficiencies. So do we have any thoughts on any potential differential diagnoses here, or any additional testing that you might want? Perfect. So yeah, we'll take a little pause here. And if you guys want to throw some things in the comments, we did have a couple of questions that I'll read um, and then I can uh, help answer those. But did he have any other autoantibodies associated with diabetes, IA2, anti-insulin, or did he have any anti-gangliocide autoantibodies? So he had at the time when he had that initial uh, CSF testing, he had pretty a, a full kind of battery of autoantibody testing, more so related to the um, 
you know, uh, neuropathy. And all of that was negative. The only one that was positive was the uh, GAD, as uh, Carl mentioned. And uh, at the time, or, you know, per the notes of neurology at that time, they weren't really too concerned about that, didn't feel that it was uh, very suggestive of this. And, uh, but everything else was negative. Specifically, as far as other autoantibodies associated with diabetes, I don't know that those were checked. He did not have any, you know, symptoms or evidence of type 1 diabetes. He did not have hyperglycemia, you know, um, and was not diagnosed with diabetes. They also brought up some differentials such as mitochondrial disease, uh, checking things like a lactic acid, pyruvate ratio. Uh, patient, people are asking about some markers of HLH. Do you have any evidence of that? How high a titer was the GAD65 antibody, high or low? Um, I believe we had the value on a previous slide, but it, it was considered fairly low according to neurology. They weren't too concerned. I am not as familiar with this antibody, but as I mentioned, uh, they weren't. And then another was response to test vaccination. So maybe thinking about, you know, a little bit further immune evaluation or auto-inflammatory evaluation. Great. So these, you know, these are some good thoughts and to keep up with time, we'll keep going, but it's, it's kind of a case of, well, you know, why is this patient really here in immunology? It's an interesting story, but it may not be necessarily our typical sort of case that we would get. Um, but I think these are all great thoughts and, and some things to keep in mind when you're evaluating the patient. So Carl, if you want to go ahead with what was kind of done next. So the, are some of our initial di uh, differentials for uh, this sort of presentation, Guillain-Barre, but that's typically much more acute uh, ascending paralysis type picture, uh, monoclonal uh, gammopathy associated neuropathies, HIV, uh, diabetic and uh, uremic neuropathies, which of course present very differently, uh, poems, as well as for the fact that he had re recurrent uh, uh, lymphadenopathy, Castleman's disease, and different inherited uh, neuropathies such as uh, charcot mary tooth disease. So the initial workup, well, we, uh, we have some uh, additional immunodeficiency diagnoses that are specific to immunodeficiencies. CBID and this uh, USID, uh, USID net uh, cohort showed about 1.4% of cases with uh, associated a neurologic autoimmune disease, and five of 19 had demyelinating disease. And there are some case reports of um, myelitis associated with motor weakness, uh, paresthesia, sensory loss, that's uh, responsive to steroids or TNF alpha, uh, TNF alpha inhibitors. And we also see some uh, primary immunodeficiency literature. Uh, Zigner et al. reported about 14 patients with uh, various immunodeficiencies. We see four uh, XLA patients, five patients with hyper IgM, uh, three CVID, one SCID, and one uh, common immunodeficiency case, all with uh, progressive neurodegeneration. Um, a variety of different ages of presentation. Seven had ataxia in coordination motor deficits. One had a biopsy showing patchy demyelinization and uh, neuronal loss. And CD59, which is commonly associated with the paroxysmal nocturnal uh, hemoglobin area, PNH, also can present with uh, CDIP. And demyelinating uh, neuropathy uh, has been reported in uh, two patients with Shadekagashi syndrome. So our initial immune workup, and you see that there's uh, there's an anemia with a hemoglobin of 12.9, it's microcytic. You can also note that on his, his uh, antibodies, his IgG levels are within normal levits, but uh, he it was receiving IVIG at this time. His IgM is a little low, but he's also uh, getting steroids as, as well. Uh, IgA is normal. Normal complement. His lymphocyte uh, subsets are all normal except for CD19, but the, he had received those three rounds of rituximab. And his monoclonal studies were all normal, HIV. It's also negative. Some additional workup was obtained, such as a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis. 
showing some borderline enlarged axillary um, and subpectoral lymph nodes. Also sort of some mild bronchial wall thickening, but no uh, enlarged lymph nodes in the abdomen or the pelvis, no hepatomegaly, splenomegaly. Um, and the previous nerve biopsies were re-examined and immunohistochemistry was done, um, demonstrating predominantly CD3 positive staining with some scattered CD8 and CD4 little and little CD20. Electron microscopy showed an abundance of uh, world-like formations, generalized uh, small to moderate onion bulbs, and most myelinated fibers had a thin myelin sheaths with some demyelination. Um, but our uh, uh, patient actually presented initially to uh, the clinic actually with this already done. This is a trio whole exome sequencing that did show uh, a homozygous pathogenic mutation for caspase 8. And both the mother and the father were heterozygous carriers for this. We kind of went through this presentation just to kind of think about some of these differentials if we didn't have this, uh, this uh, whole exome sequencing data already. So let's talk about uh, caspase 8 deficiency. So caspase 8. Um, DISC is, uh, activates downstream caspase pathways in apoptosis or programmed cell death, which is required to eliminate autoimmune, autoreactive autoimmune uh, lymphocytes. Now, corticosteroids are very effective at preventing lymphocyte prolifer proliferation and often used as first line for the treatment of ALPS. Um, another option is serolemus or rapamycin-induced apoptosis in both a normal and abnormal lymphocytes, and it's effective in treating lymphoproliferation in ALPS patients as well. Caspase A also has an important other function as well, just as it plays an important role in the extrinsic pathway of apoptosis. Um, it's also um, important in uh, lymphocyte activation through the NF uh, kappa B pathway, as shown here. So while caspase A deficiency was initially classified as an ALPS type 2B, it's now considered separate from ALPS. And caspase A shows defective T, B cell, and K cell activation. So the literature on caspase 8 patients, there are about seven that have been reported so far. Uh, there are two reported in a uh, 2002 Nature paper by Chun et al. with siblings, a 12-year-old female and 11-year-old male, who both had lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, recurrent uh, sinopulmonary and cutaneous HSV infections. And they had deficits in T, B, and NK cells with poor response to vaccinations. Um, the decreased T cell proliferation and some hypogammaglobulinemia, but they had a homozygous caspase A mutation. There are also two siblings reported in 2015 by Nima et al. with homozygous caspase mutations. The first patient was a female who was healthy until age 38 and then developed pulmonary hypertension and interstitial lung disease. The second was a male who was healthy until age 37 and then developed a complex neurologic syndrome with dysphagia, migraines, trigeminal neuralgia, and cranial nerve palsies. He had a one centimeter mass that was uh, from the Meckel's cave resected that showed some necrotizing granulomas. And he also suffered from recurrent lung infections, liver and spleen, nodular organomegaly. And then we also have a few papers, one fr from uh, Kinderova um, in 2019. Sorry, I'm maybe mispronouncing that. But this was a case of a 15-year-old male presented with failure to thrive, current lymphadenopathy, bloody stools, rectal prolapse, prairie anal fistula, and hepatosplenomegaly and anemia. 
several recurrent sinopulmonary infections, fevers of unknown origin, and actually had pneumonia at a very young age, at age five, um, and generalized uh, uh, lympho lymphadenopathy with low IgA and IgM and poor vaccine response with another novel uh, homozygous variant of caspase 8. And then uh, Lael in uh, 2019 showed uh, three unrelated patients, all with a very early onset IBD, presenting with failure to thrive, diarrhea, perianal stricturing. It was refractory to elemental formulas, azathioprine and fliximab, and also had increased susceptibility to infection. And one patient died from uh, septic complications. And here you can see that they had uh, normal, uh, novel caspase 8 mutations in patients 1 and patient 2. In mice models, uh, complete deficiency is incompatible with life. But uh, targeted T and B cell uh, caspase 8 mutations results in decreased peripheral T cells, impaired immune response to infection, and these older mice develop uh, lethal lymphoproliferative disease with uh, infiltration into the lungs, liver, kidneys, splenomegaly, hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy. But increased in NLRP3 mediated inflammasome activity um, in dendritic cells with increased IL-1B is also seen. And loss of caspase 8 in interstitial uh, epithelium, leading to the TNF-alpha-mediated alpha epithelial cell destruction was also seen in these mice. So with that in mind, what additional workup or thoughts on next steps that we have? Yeah, so we have a couple comments, which I'll get to um, in a second, but if anybody else has any other thoughts, you know, now that you have this data, this information, we get our, our genetic testing back um, and you have this, what are some additional tests or, or things that you might want to do for the patient? And uh, while people might be adding anything else to the chat, I'll ask Dr. Lighting if she wants to chime in. If, um, you know, you have a patient that presents like this and you get kind of an unexpected finding maybe on your genetic testing, how do you use that information to kind of guide you going forward? Sure. So hi, hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, so, you know, I guess my initial thoughts with this is, and I think we see this a lot in our immunology practices, and, and this is a good example of how sometimes the genetic report isn't always super useful in helping you treat the patient. And so I think this is an example of that. It's great to put a name to his problem, um, but he still has a problem. <laughs> and so that's, that's the, the, the example of how do you deal with that? And so at least how I think about this in my practice is really thinking about the pathophysiology of what's actually going on. And so you've shown through your workup that this patient is very steroid dependent and can't get off them, um, really very much, um, uh, uh, has a worsened course when you back down on them. And so you know that whatever steroids are doing, they are doing something. And so as you, as you pointed out, Carl, um, steroids are very immune suppressing, but very nonspecific. And so, um, maybe a way to think about this is how do I get more specific? And so the, the sort of holy grail is to be very precise and be very, you know, precision based, based on the pathway that's being affected. And it would be nice if there were a specific drug that interfered with caspase eight activity, if we think that's exactly what's driving his demyelination. Uh, but you have shown at least without that, that there's T cell infiltration at the nerve. And I think that's the place to start is how do you impact that pathway? How do you prevent lymphoproliferation that's affecting the nerve specifically? And so, you know, you do know that his genetic defect has to do with, with apoptosis uh, defects. And so relying on some of the literature that looks at steroid sparing agents in that, in that um, pathway, I think makes sense. And this is, again, a good example of where you're thinking more like pathway centric instead of genetic centric. Um, and using some of those agents to potentially try in this patient. Um, the other consideration I think you have to think about and weigh here is how much of this is truly reversible. He's lived with this disease for now 
whatever, 10 plus years, um, almost two decades. And so is there any, you know, what, what is the, what it's a little bit of expectation management for everybody. What is the actual goal of what you're going to be able to achieve with medication? So that's how I think about it in these, in these cases. And frankly, I think we see this kind of thought process a lot more frequently than the, oh, it's this gene. And this is exactly what you do for that genetic abnormality. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have to really think pathway specific and, you know, nobody's going to live forever on steroids. So you have to think about how am I going to deal with, with uh, all the ramifications of steroids? That was great. Thanks so much. And that was really uh, kind of thinking about Carl's, you know, bringing up the pathways, uh, kind of looking at that. And so a couple of the questions that we had um, in the chat, people had asked about like other autoantibodies, you know, well, at this point, um, you know, I'd have to go back and I'd have to look specifically at the panel that was run before to know, um, but I don't have those ones specifically, but, you know, given this genetic finding, someone had asked for a double negative T cells. So that's kind of, I think we have our next slide on some of the additional labs that were done. And Carl, we'll probably have to run through those pretty quick. Um, and then we'll get to kind of what, what we have him on now. And then if anyone has any any other thoughts to chime in? All right. So I'll show the the uh, the double negative T cell data um, that, that was very astutely pointed out. That that actually came back uh, normal with this patient, as well as the B twelve that we typically expect to be a, a little bit elevated with ALPS. The cytokine panel um, well, there's elevations, but a pretty minimal TNF alpha and IL-10, but the IL-18 is a little bit more increased. Um, the really interesting thing is that the soluble fast ligands was elevated and the fast mediated apoptosis, which we expect to see um, be less efficient and uh, uh, caspase-8 deficiency was uh, decreased as seen there. So now our, our uh, patient remains on IVIG 30 grams every other week and on methylpred, uh, one, uh, 100 milligrams weekly. Um, and every time attempting to wean um, in the past, it has developed work, worsening weakness. So started serolemus at, at 2.5 milligrams per day, um, increasing to three milligrams per day with troughs somewhere between uh, five to 11 nanograms per milliliter. So that was great, Carl. So yeah, so, you know, we got these additional labs kind of looking along the ALPS pathway. Now, in some of the other cases that Carl mentioned, um, a lot of them actually don't have the classically really highly elevated double negative T cells with caspate. That's kind of why it's been differentiated somewhat differently from um, the other ALPS disorders is they don't necessarily meet all of those ALPS criteria classically, you know, but part of it, part of it is to know, you know, is that partly the treatments that he's been on or as Dr. Lighting, you know, pointed out versus, um, you know, just part of the disease as well. But thinking about the pathway, that was our thought with adding in the serolimus to see if we could try to wean the steroids at least. Um, as Dr. Lighting had mentioned, you know, I'm not sure how reversible we're, we're really going to be, or it's more about stabilization and not having progression and loss of more function as he's had over time. Um, and so kind of thinking about, you know, we added in the serolimus and, and he's stable for now. And, uh, we've not really been able to wean the steroids too much yet, but they are planning on working on that uh, with the help of neurology neurology follows him closely as well, um, to try to wean that. But I just love to hear if anyone has any other thoughts on additional treatments and someone just threw in the chat MMF, like whether we think that would be a better option. That's certainly something wouldn't have to follow the troughs, which might be the benefit of that. I have a little bit of trouble with the troughs with him that I think that are, are affected by the IV steroids. So one time when, you know, one week, the trough is five next month, the trough is 11, you know, and uh, without changing any of the dose and really other no changes, somebody threw in the uh, comments of Adicept. And I think that's another good thought um, to think about targeting those T cells. And if they're being overactive and proliferative, maybe that's a a route that we need to go um, and uh, think about, you know, what are some better options to to see if we can wean off the steroids, I think is kind of our primary goal right now. And of course, preventing progression in this patient. But with that, I think we've hit right at the nine o'clock hour. So we really appreciate everyone for joining us. And we thank you so much for our senior mentors, Dr. Lighting and Dr. Nodoro Angelo. I think he's still on and listening. Um, It was a great time. We always have a great time with these cases. So please join us next month. We'll have another 
uh, case as well, uh, two cases. And uh, if you have any cases or you're interested in presenting them or you have a resident or a fellow who would like to present, you know, please reach out to the CIS um, and let us know if you have any. The Early Career Immunologist Committee is the one that puts it on and we're always happy to work with anybody else who'd like to get involved. And we thank you all so much for joining tonight. Thank you. Good night. Thank Bye you. On.